The video for today is a bit of a break from the big name navies to look at a smaller nation. Admittedly, this is still a navy that was a world power at one point in time. By the 20th century, however, well, the Spanish Armada was very much a thing of the past. This is most obvious in the Espana-class battleship, the smallest of all dreadnoughts. It is also apparent in the topic of this video, the Spanish cruiser Canarius, a modified take on the British county-class cruiser with a protracted construction process, including multiple changes of ownership. The ship was laid down when Spain was a kingdom. She was then launched under the Spanish Republican government, where she was promptly seized and complete by the nationalist faction in the Spanish Civil War. This cruiser saw three governments before she was even completed. If nothing else speaks to Spain's decline as a great power, this certainly does. This is not to say Canarius didn't give good service in her own way. Her sister was rather less fortunate, but that will be a different video. In any event, let's begin with the design history. Now, for those who don't look at the community posts, I got really sick last week. My voice, as you can tell, still hasn't fully recovered. That's why this video is coming now, when it was intended for last Thursday, and also why there was no shipwreck video this weekend. I apologize for how rough my voice still is, but I didn't want to delay any longer. Hopefully that won't be too distracting. In any case, let's get back to the video. The Canarius-class cruisers originated in a Spanish naval program of 1926. As I mentioned earlier, the Spanish Navy was in a rough state at the time. One of the three dreadnoughts, España herself, had run aground and been wrecked in 1923. Of their cruisers, only a handful were modern, and even those were light cruisers. The result was Spain seeing a strong need for more modern warships. As a result, the Spanish government ordered two new heavy cruisers. While Spain was not a signatory to the Washington Naval Treaty, these new ships were still treaty cruisers in the traditional sense. They were designed broadly to the 10,000 ton displacement limit. This isn't a surprise, as these ships were heavily based on the British County class, which were themselves treaty cruisers. That design lineage held true with the Spanish ships, leading them to be, more or less, treaty compliant. There was also a certain desire in the Spanish government to hold to potential future treaties. Before moving on, I'll note here that I often see Philip Watts cited as the designer for these ships. That would be an interesting case, considering the naval program was approved in July of 1926, and Watts died in March of 1926. I can make a joke about zombie ship designers here, but the more likely answer is simple. Either some confusion in the exact design process, or they were based on work Watts and his team did, but not explicitly designed by him, unless the Spanish approached him before approving the naval program but without access to the archives, I can't be sure on that. Either way, the general claim remains that Philip Watts designed these ships. Regardless of where the design originated, the Canarius-class cruisers were very similar to their British counterparts, specifically to HMS Kent. The armor protection was functionally identical, for example. The Spanish cruisers even retained external torpedo bulges, which the British removed on later counties. The hull form was also similar, with a slightly increased length and a slightly reduced beam. The Kent class was 630 feet, 192 meters long, and had a beam of 68 feet, or 21 meters. Canarius was 636 feet, 194 meters long, with a beam of 64 feet, or 20 meters. And, of course, the main battery was the exact same. Eight 8-inch guns and four twin turrets. 
Where things really changed were the superstructure and the machinery. On the Spanish ships, the bridge was raised one deck level. And, during construction, it was changed into an entirely distinct design. This is quite clear when you compare the two ships. The machinery, meanwhile, was increased by 10,000 shaft horsepower. This required changes to the machinery spaces, which resulted in a different funnel layout. Initially, two funnels that were then trunked into one large funnel, and then, later on, back into two traditional smokestacks. That does cover the design history, at least in basic form, so I'll wrap this up with the technical details on their own. The Canarius class displaced 10,840 tons at standard loading. This rose to 13,700 tons at the full load. On that displacement, the cruisers carried eight 8 inch 203 mm guns. The layout was identical to the British design. Two super firing pairs, one pair ahead of the bridge, and one pair on the stern. As designed, these were supported by eight 4.7-inch secondary guns, as well as 12 21-inch torpedo tubes and four triple mounts, and a smattering of anti-aircraft guns, both 40mm and 20mm. We'll see later on that this was not how the ships were completed. Armor protection, meanwhile, was quite thin. A 2-inch thick main belt with the magazines protected by a 4-inch armored box. The design speed was 33 knots on 90,000 shaft horsepower through four shafts. With all of that out of the way, we can now move on to service history. Both of the Canarius-class cruisers were built in the SECN dockyard in Ferrol, Spain. This was the only Spanish yard capable of building such advanced ships, so both of the sisters were laid down there on August 15th, 1928. Things would derail fairly quickly. Economic issues became a real problem soon after these ships were laid down. Canarius would not launch until May 28th, 1931 as a result. Her sister, Belarus, wasn't launched until April 20th, 1932. By the time they entered the water, the cruisers went through their first change of government. The Spanish monarchy fell in 1931, replaced by the Second Spanish Republic. Continuing financial issues, and now political problems, further delayed completion of the cruisers. Their fitting out process was long, drawn out, and never actually completed to the original design. Canarius ran her sea trials in 1934 without her aft turrets. This went well, by all indications, as the ship returned to dock to finish construction, which continued at a slow rate until the second change of government. In the event, the Spanish Civil War broke out in July of 1936. Both of the cruisers were still incomplete at the time. Canarius lacked her secondary battery, fire control equipment, and seaplane catapult. Both of the ships were captured in dock by the Spanish nationalists soon after the war broke out. Incomplete or not, they instantly became the most powerful ships in the nationalist fleet, which did also include España, the renamed Alfonso XIII. That dreadnought was old, however, and by no means a modern combatant. Unsurprisingly, the nationalists rushed the cruisers through the finishing touches of construction. Hastily trained crews were assembled, and Canarius was fit with whatever the Nationalists could scrounge up. Old 4-inch guns, and even older 57mm weapons, came from España. Light anti-aircraft guns were completely lacking. To make up for the missing fire control system, a junior officer rigged up a Vickers system from a shore battery to replace the missing equipment. It was a hack job, but it worked. With the old guns, the improvised fire control, and a motivated but undertrained crew, Canarius entered service in September of 1936. Her first mission came soon after, as the new cruiser was sent to open the Straits of Gibraltar. This mission began on September 27, 1936. By the night of the 28th, Canarius and another cruiser, Almirante Cervera, 
had reached the strait. A pair of Republican destroyers patrolling the area had the misfortune to run into the cruisers. One was damaged by Cervera, while the other one was located by Canarius at 6.40 a.m. on September 29th. That destroyer, Almirante Ferrandes, was hit by accurate fire from Canarius and sunk within the hour. With the Spanish Republican fleet occupied elsewhere, the cruiser could do her mission. Canarius and other ships began shipping nationalist forces from Africa to Spain. This was more important than the sinking of the destroyer, even if it wasn't a war-winning move in of itself. After that initial transport run, the cruiser remained in the area. Her new duty was escorting convoys and hunting Republican shipping. During this process, Canarius did not sink any other Republican ships. Her guns mostly found use in bombarding shore targets. Useful, but not exciting. Excitement came, instead, from an unexpected source. On December 14, 1936, Canarius caused an international incident. A Soviet ship, Komsomol, had been shipping material to the Republicans multiple times. On the late afternoon of December 14, Canarius caught the Russian ship off the Spanish coast, and promptly sank her without, apparently, verifying what cargo the ship was carrying. Regardless of what the Russians had been shipping, this action led to a sharp decline in Soviet shipments. An international incident, to be sure, but one that didn't really hurt the nationalists, and can be argued as helping them. In any case, with this done, the cruiser returned to blockade duty. She would gradually begin to receive new guns, with six of the 4.7-inch weapons fitted in October of 1936. This also saw the antique 4-inch guns removed at the same time, while the 57mm guns remained aboard. Two twin 37mm anti-aircraft guns and three single 20mm cannon came from Germany at the same time. With these new guns, Canarius continued her mission off the Republican-held coast, at least at first. Soon after the sinking of Comosol, the Spanish cruiser would receive damage of her own. On February 13, 1937, she collided with a Greek freighter. This ripped open her starboard side and necessitated a return to dock for repair work. This would last until March of 1937. When the repairs were completed, Canarius returned to blockade duty. This was fairly quiet, aside from the odd interception of merchant ships. The only real action came in engaging light forces, like Republican patrol boats. Until, that is, March 8th of 1937. On that day, she captured Mar Contabrico, a liner-turned-supply ship. This was loaded with military equipment, and was quite the prize for the Nationalists. Both for the military equipment, funneled to the army, and for the ship herself, which became an armed merchant cruiser under the nationalist flag. As for Canarius, the rest of the Spanish Civil War would pass on the same duty as before, chasing destroyers around and generally making a menace of herself. With one notable exception, however, that was the Battle of Cape Palos, the largest battle between the nationalists and republican fleets. It was a chaotic affair in a lot of ways. The respective formations met in the dark night without even intending to. It was an accidental encounter more than an intentional battle. The Republicans, with two light cruisers and five destroyers, engaged the Nationalists. The Nationalists, for their part, had the two Canarias sisters and the Almirante Cervera. The initial engagement between the cruisers amounted to little. Neither side did any damage to the other in the cruiser action. However, illuminated by star shells and her gun flashes, Bolaris was about to have a very bad day. Three of the Republican destroyers fired a volley of torpedoes in her direction. Two or three of them hit between her forward turrets with devastating results. Bolaris had her forward magazine detonate 
along with secondary explosions. She would ultimately sink with the loss of over 700 men. Canarius, under direct orders from the Admiral in command, left her sister to her fate. Nearby British destroyers picked up the survivors and later transferred them to the other Nationalist cruisers. After this, Canarius would only see one more surface action. On the night of August 27th, 1938, the cruiser engaged the Republican destroyer, Jose Luis Diaz. Canarius heavily damaged her Republican enemy, but the destroyer managed to slip away to Gibraltar. With that battle done, the remainder of the Civil War saw little in the way of exciting moments. This is not surprising, really. The war ended soon enough, on April 1st, 1939. With the end of the Spanish Civil War, the cruiser's combat career also came to an end. She had a long and successful career in that conflict, even if it saw few engagements with enemy surface forces. The ship had 175 war sorties over a little under three years, which is nothing to sneeze at. However, with Spanish neutrality in the Second World War, she never again fought other ships. Canaria spent the Second World War enforcing Spanish neutrality or on various refits. Just the usual things for neutral nations. Probably the most exciting thing to happen during the war years, as a result, was the sinking of Bismarck. Canarius and two Spanish destroyers raced to the scene to try and rescue survivors after the battleship sank. Unfortunately for the German crew, the Spanish ships arrived too late to save anyone. They only found five bodies after a three-day search. After that failed rescue mission, there is little else to note during the war years. Canarius and the Spanish in general did very little. The same can be said for the remainder of her career, in all honesty. After the war ended, the cruiser returned to peacetime duty, showing the flag, patrolling, and generally supporting Spanish interests. That said, even with her treaty-limited design, she remained Spain's most powerful surface warship going into the Cold War. Because of this, the ship would receive a major refit in October of 1952. This removed some of the 37mm cannon, replacing them with 40mm Bofors guns built under Spanish license. This was the more modern L-70 model of the gun, not the more famous World War II era model. While certainly useful, the more visible change came in her superstructure. The bridge received some changes, and the trunked funnels were split into two individual stacks. If you see a picture of the ship with twin funnels, you are seeing her after 1952. By the same token, if the ship has a trunked funnel, it's from before the 1950s refit. This would be her final layout, for the most part. A tripod foremast was added for radar and other electronic equipment. A bipod support was also added to the main mast for much the same reason. However, the cruiser was increasingly showing her age by the end of the decade. The Spanish Navy wanted to modernize her along the lines of other cruisers, in the 1960s, replacing her big guns with guided missiles and her secondary weaponry with more modern American models. This refit was put forward to the United States, who sent a team to really look the ship over. A joint Spanish-American examination quickly came to the conclusion that a full modernization wasn't practical. For whatever capability Canarius could gain, Smaller ships could do better and cheaper. Instead, a small overhaul in 1969 focused on improving her electronic equipment. By the middle of the following decade, the 1970s, the cruiser was reaching her end. Increasingly worn out and thoroughly obsolete, Canarius was decommissioned on December 17, 1975. Efforts were made to make her a museum ship, but the money simply didn't materialize. As a result, this historic ship was scrapped in 1978. 
Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content. And I'll see you in the next one. Hopefully with a recovered voice.